When last we left our heroes, right? That's how you know D&D has started. Those of you following along at home, uh, my friends on Thursday night, the last time we played, they were in the lower level of Broken Spire Keep. They had released some of the prisoners. There are other prisoners in the keep. They haven't found them yet. And now they were in the jail cells in the lower level. And unbeknownst to them, all the bad guys in the entire keep were coming down to fight them. This happens all the time in my games. I don't know why. I don't know why it happens to me, but it's often I must be doing something to encourage the players to do this. Uh, maybe I'm doing it on purpose. Maybe I'm doing it subconsciously, but they often end up trying to stealth their way past the bad guys to the objective at the bottom of the dungeon. This is one of those cases. The players successfully infiltrated Broken Spire Keep without any of the orcs knowing anything about it. They got down to the lower level of the keep where the dungeons are. They managed to kill the guard in the jail cell without the guard alerting anybody. They lock the jail cell behind them. They open up all the jail cells. They free the prisoners and they spend 20 or 30 minutes role playing the act of meeting these prisoners and saying like, what are you doing down here? What do you know? Reuniting some of the players with NPCs they used to adventure with. Meanwhile, of course, the bad guys are aware of this because Graves, the warlock, managed to bypass the orc sentry by using his telepathy to convince the guard that Grumsh, the god of the orcs, was telling him he needed to report to his boss. His boss is the head of Broken Spire Keep, so when the orc reports to his boss, the boss now knows. Of course, he knows Grumsh didn't tell him to do anything. These are the PCs. They're assaulting the keep. So now there's drama. There's tension. The bad guy is alerted to the presence of the heroes. He gets his lieutenants. He gets the human cleric who's been working with him, and they're going to get all the orcs and hellhounds and the keep together, and they're going to attack and ideally, from their point of view, kill the heroes that they know are locked in the jail cell. This is a maneuver my friend Jordy calls the patented Colville screw. When you've stealthed your way to the bottom of the dungeon only to make some critical mistake alerting the entire dungeon to your presence. So whereas a normal party would have step by step explored the dungeon, now the dungeon is going to come to explore you. And that's exactly what's happening now. The party's on one side of a reinforced iron door that leads to the jail cells, and all of the orcs in the keep, including Bonebreaker Doracor, the orc chieftain, and Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, St. Ajax, stay tuned, are on the other side, along with another 10 orcs and four hellhounds. Bonebreaker Doracor is wielding a huge black iron great axe. Its edge is serrated to look like teeth. It's called Wound. It's a plus two great axe. It crits on a 19 or 20, and anyone that it crits then suffers a wound. Every turn, they have to make a constitution check, and if they fail, they take a d6 bleed damage. This is a powerful item, but there really isn't anyone in the party who can use it without giving something up. Maybe the dwarf could use it, but it's not clear if the dwarf would use an orcish weapon. Bonebreaker Doricor also has a dwarven belt around his waist. It is the belt of Gurk the Mountain Breaker. Now the dwarf war priest Keck had a chance to figure out what that belt was, because it's a legendary item among the dwarves, but he failed his history check so he doesn't know. And therefore, right now, neither do you. But you can kind of guess, right? So an orc chief and a human priest, ten orcs, four hellhounds, holy moly, the party is third level. Don't worry, not all the bad guys can fight at once. It sounds worse than it is. On the party side is Nicodemus, the half-orc fighter, Keck, the dwarven priest, Graves, the human warlock, Sai, the elven ranger, Pendleton, the human thief, and Iagushka, the human druid. They also just freed three NPCs that can help them out. They freed Horak, the unwashed, who was a party member with Graves, the warlock, in an earlier adventure. He's a dwarf fighter who's ready to rock. They free another dwarf named Hax, the infidel, who's a dwarven cleric. And they free Sir Arkazovar, the dragonborn paladin who, being inspired by seeing the shield of Andrim, an ancient symbol of nobility, wielded by the half-orc and Nicodemus who came to save these guys, has pledged himself as a knight in service to Nicodemus. Now these NPCs have no gear, so they can't really fight well, but the heroes have some extra gear they can share. There's not really anything they can do about the absence of any armor, and it wouldn't matter even if they could, because none of these NPCs have time to put any armor on. So you know who's on one side of the door, Bonebreaker Doracor and all his guys. You know who's on the other side of the door, Graves and Nicodemus and the rest of the heroes and their NPCs. So the heroes immediately begin trying to figure out what they're going to do. The bad guys are on the other side of the door. They haven't said anything yet. They're marshalling their forces. They're getting ready to do something. Maybe ram the door down, maybe try to burn the heroes out. They don't know. So the heroes start searching around and they find a secret door. Now, they find that secret door because I had to put it there. But in my defense, let's take a look at the map and I'll show you exactly what I did. Okay, so here on the right is the original map of Broken Spire Keep, lower level, and you can see how there's a secret door on the outside of the area the heroes are in. There's this long hallway and a secret door to the north. And all I did was I opened up Photoshop, I brought the map into Photoshop, and I just moved that secret door so it's inside the room with the jail cells. And then once I had done that, I literally printed the map out again because I was a little worried that the players might say, oh, it's super convenient that there's a secret door in here. Matt is taking it easy on us. 
right? That's something I always worry about. Maybe you don't have to worry about that as a DM, but I'm always concerned that my players are going to feel as though the verisimilitude, the illusion of reality has broken down and that things are happening because Matt's trying to keep the party alive or alternatively, Matt's trying to keep the bad guy alive. I mean, obviously I didn't need to bring the map into Photoshop and actually move the secret door on the map just for my purposes. I did this in anticipation of the players complaining that the secret door was something I had made up, that there wasn't really a secret door there, that I was taking it easy on them. Which, in a sense, obviously I was, but that's part of the illusion, that's part of the smoke and mirrors. There really was a secret door in that area, it's kind of not the PC's fault that it was in the middle of a corridor instead of where they needed it to be. So I printed this map out and took it with me to the game and used it instead of my original map just in case any of the players said, oh, how convenient, there's a secret door in here. Because you know now, I hate that. If that had happened, I would have been able to take the map out and show them the map and say, how dare you, sir? But as it turned out, that didn't happen for a couple reasons. One, because I think it felt natural that in the room where the jailer was, right, the guy who holds the key to the jail cells, was also the room with the secret door. But also the secret door was really well hidden, and when they found it and opened it, they didn't check for traps first, so a glyph of warding went off and did some ridiculous amount of damage to them. You know, I'm not even sure I looked up how much damage glyph of warding does, and frankly, I'm not even sure glyph of warding is in 5th edition. I just described this thing that I have known from many editions of D&D, and I rolled some dice. I think I rolled, like, six four-sided dice or something like that. It might have been four four-sided dice. And so the first thing that happens is the druid player who's like, I'll open the door, this glyph blows up in his face. So when that happened, they really felt like they earned that secret door. Does that make sense? Like it wasn't purely just a convenient thing I put there, it was a challenge. And as soon as Zach, the druid player said, okay, I'm just gonna open the door and I picked up the dice, he went, oh, why didn't we search for traps? That's when I know it's working, when the players are thinking, why didn't we do this? Why didn't we think of this rather than why is Matt doing this to us? So they open the secret door, they survive the glyph of warding, they go in and they find what is effectively a little apartment that the cleric bad guy has been using, the priest of St. Ajax. And this is a very strange thing. How is there a priest of St. Ajax? No one in one of my campaigns has ever met a priest of St. Ajax. And you watching this probably don't know why that is a weird thing. Ajax is the invincible overlord. He's the ulti He's the Ming the Merciless of this campaign. He's high level. The players are going to have to be like 15th level before they fight this guy. And he has taken over the entire area. Right, so he is a high level bad guy, kind of beyond the scope of the campaign at this level. And suddenly now we're seeing bad guys who worship him as a saint. And it appears to be working, this bad guy gets power from St. Ajax. So that's just a little thing I threw in there to make it seem as though the campaign is a living thing and is evolving over time. Ajax is gaining more power. And they have found this priest of St. Ajax's apartment, and in here are treth <laughs> trests of treasure. And in this apartment are chests of treasure. There's a lot of gold in here, but there's also several magic items. And the players know they're magic items because in my campaign setting, human beings can sense magic. It's not the same as detect magic. Detect magic gives you more information, but a human being, if he's around the presence of a magic item or a permanent magical effect, they smell this strange thing in the air. It's ozone. Of course, I don't describe it as ozone because that would be a thing that a medieval character wouldn't know about, but that's the idea. They smell this metallic tinge in the air. There are reasons for that in my campaign, we don't need to go into it. So they know these things are magic and they start looking at them and figuring out which of these are useful. And all these items have something in common and that is none of them are usable by a cleric and that's the way they figured out, oh, this is the cleric's chamber. So in this room, along with a bunch of gold is a white arrow. And they're like, what is this white arrow? And I describe it to them and they're not sure what it's made out of because they can't tell, is it ivory? Is it bone? There's a potion in here, and they don't know what kind of potion it is, but it is in a stone vial. There's a ring. They don't know what the ring does. The dwarf Keck puts the ring on and says, do I notice anything? Do I turn invisible? I said, no, you don't turn invisible. If you move around, you do kind of notice that you feel a little bit more unstoppable. And Keck's player TJ is like, yeah, I'm keeping this ring. I think he thought it was a ring of uh, dexterity or something like that. It's not. You might be able to guess what it was, but they haven't identified it yet, so I'm not going to tell you. They find a rod, like a black rod, and they don't know what that does. They find a staff. It's a quarter staff, and it looks like it's made out of burned ash. And whoever touches it gets ash on their fingers. And if you tap it against the ground, ash cascades off it. And it doesn't seem to matter how much you rub it, there's always more ash coming off. So it looks like something that has been burned, but it also has this kind of weird property where there's never an end to the amount of ash that comes off this thing. And it doesn't appear to be like a normal piece of breakable wood. It's obviously a magic item. The players didn't identify that, so they don't know what it does. You might be able to guess based on my description, but the druid player took it. He wasn't super happy about it because it doesn't seem like a good guy thing, which indeed it's not. 
But druids are neutral. They're not super worried about good versus evil. There's a two-handed maul, which is the partner to the belt that Bonebreaker Doracor is wearing. And once again, the dwarf has a chance to make a history check and figure out what it does, but he doesn't recognize it. He takes the maul anyway, and he swings it a couple times and says, does it do anything? And I describe it as, you know, having a good weight to it. And I describe the runes that are on it, but it doesn't seem to do anything except maybe you sort of feel like it pulls a little bit toward the elf. Kex player TJ is like, well, I don't know what that means, but that sounds cool, so I'll take it. They find an arcane scroll with three spells on it. And the funny thing was, when I described the first spell, Contact Other Plane, Phil, playing Graves, probably the only person who can really use it, is like, Contact Other Plane? What is that? So I described this spell and how it's actually really useful. It's a high-level spell, and he can use it to talk to his patron and get answers to questions that he might not otherwise know the answer to. And we spent so much time talking about Contact Other Plane that I literally forgot to tell him what else was on that scroll until about two rounds into the combat. Also on that scroll is The Hunger of Hadar, which if you don't know what does, stay tuned. And the other one's Gash's Form. Now, if you're wondering, are these random magic items? The answer is no, I put all these in here on purpose. But I always want to give the illusion that the items are somewhat randomized. I talk about having rolled on charts and stuff like that. And sometimes I do do that to get inspiration. But typically I give out items that shore up the player's deficiencies or make some players feel special. They find armor in here. There's armor and weapons. None of the armor or weapons seems to be magical, but it means the NPCs they found could gear up if they had time. So they found a bunch of magic items. They don't have a way to identify any of them. Graves can cast Identify if he has 10 minutes, because he can cast it as a ritual. They have NPCs that can help them, but the NPCs now have weapons that they get from this room. And there's armor in this room, but they don't have time to put the armor on. It will only take about 10 minutes, but they don't have 10 minutes. The bad guys on the other side of the door start delivering their ultimatums. Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, calls out to the characters inside the jail. Now, I don't remember exactly what kind of little speech I gave, I apologize, but he basically said, hand over the warlock and we'll let you guys out. I think he opened by saying, uh, attention in the jail, there is a way for most of you to get out of this alive. So the bad guys have demanded the warlock, and again, that reinforces the idea that they're looking for spellcasters. That's part of the plot of this adventure is there's someone, and these guys work for them, kidnapping spellcasters and sending them into the Underdark. They haven't explicitly said Underdark, they've just said below. But the players know that means Underdark. So now the players start looking at each other and thinking, what can we do with this? They don't ever seriously think about giving Graves over to the bad guy, but they do think about maybe there's a way to make it seem like they're going to give Graves over and use that to get some advantage. But they do talk about how, like, look, our, our characters don't know this guy. And Graves says the same thing. Graves is like, I'm getting antsy. My character is starting to think like you guys might sell me out. Even though Phil knew the other characters wouldn't do that, he was thinking, what would Graves do? Hax, the NPC dwarf who was with Graves, the warlock, it says, no, under no circumstance am I going to let you guys do this. Of course, that's not how Hax said it. What he actually said was, never, no orc can stand against us. We will die before we surrender a single breath to you. Dwarves are basically like short Klingons in my game setting. Makes them fun to play. Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, who appears to sort of be leading this thing. It's not clear who's in charge, Bonebreaker Doracor or the priest Rosad, but Rosad speaks common and Rosad calls out and says, does the angry little one speak for all of you? And of course the players are like, no, 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 he doesn't speak for us. Hang on a minute, let us talk about this. That's an important point. It was something I was waiting for them to say. As they're debating, and there was a lot of argument, they are trapped, they are behind enemy lines, there's only one door, there's only one way out, they have magic items, but they don't know what they can do with them. One of the nice things about having a relatively large group, there's now six or seven players in the group, is that you can kind of count on someone to say the thing you need them to say. And that eventually happened. Somebody said, how do we know you'll keep your word? And you must know what I said. Oh, I've given you no word to keep. Oh, I've given you no word to keep, Andrew. In my judgment, you simply have no alternative. In my judgment, you simply have no alternative. The player's like, oh, good answer. And they start debating what to do. And Rosad calls out and says, I will give you 10 minutes to think about it. The players are debating on what to do. And I had Rosad and Bonebreaker Doracor have a little conversation. I sort of expected the players to try to listen to the conversation, make a listen check, make a perception check, actually, right? Fifth edition. But they didn't do it. And if they had, what they would have learned was Rosad is explaining to Bonebreaker Doracor that the longer he lets these humans stew and debate and argue, the more likely they are to talk themselves into it, right? That's how Rosad, the evil priest, thinks. He thinks that giving them time to argue and debate the issue will raise the levels of stress and make it more likely they give in. That's the way Rosad thinks about it. Of course, what I was thinking was, I need to give these guys 10 minutes so they can put the NPC's armor on and identify some of these items. But if the players perceived it as me giving them 10 minutes to get their stuff together, they didn't act that way. They didn't say anything about that. They were just like, oh, thank God. 
And not only did they spend that 10 minutes uh, getting the NPCs armored up and weaponed up and identifying one of the items, because apparently identify only works on one item at a time, they also spent that time arguing and debating. I think the session went for about four hours, of which at least two hours was them arguing and debating about what to do, about what they could do, about what their options were, about busting out of the jail. That's probably what they were going to have to do. They were going to have to open the door at some point and charge out and fight. That wasn't so much under debate as who do we fight and how do we do it? There was a point where I said, okay, guys, it's going to be initiative. And Zach objected. Zach said, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Give us some more time. Give me some time. What? What does it say? I said time, time. Basically that. Yeah, except he didn't win a ring of invisibility out of it. So I said, fine, yeah, sure. I mean, I backed off. I was just trying to get things going. I was afraid that they were bickering as opposed to debating, if you get my meaning. Bickering is not useful. It's just sniping at each other and they're not making progress. But debating is people have different points of view. They're trying to understand different points of view. They're trying to work out what your plan means. So I found a way to give the party the 10 minutes they needed to put the NPC's armor on and cast Identify on something without it feeling too artificial. I think it felt pretty natural. But I suspect when I tell these stories and you hear me describe what happens, like the story of Calarol the Vile responding to the heroes attacking him by just decimating them and leaving them for dead without killing them, it sometimes sounds artificial, like that doesn't make sense, that's not plausible. But there's definitely a difference between me telling you guys this stuff, you know, in the comfort of my office and you're watching at home, and it actually happening in the game. When it's actually happening in the game, in the moment, these things seem a lot more plausible. That's the best advice I can give you is if it sounds like these things are not realistic, if it sounds like the people that I'm running are not behaving plausibly, I can only assure you that when it's happening in the moment, it seems a lot more real. So I needed to find a way to give them 10 minutes. I found a way. I said, you guys have your 10 minutes to debate this and then we're coming in. Spending 10 minutes casting Identify as a ritual gives Graves the opportunity to identify one item and they kind of can't decide what to identify. It's one of those things where they had many items. Some of them were obviously useful. Probably all of them were useful in one way or another. So there wasn't any clear way to determine which is the best one. What they decided was the weapons are the weapons. They're going to use the weapons and the weapons are going to do what they're going to do regardless of whether or not they understand it. Like regardless of whether or not Keck knows knows what the mall does, Keck's using the mall, and it's going to do what it does. It's just up to me, the DM, to remember that. So for instance, if he said, I hit an AC 16, I know that the mall is actually a plus two mall, then he really hit an AC 18. And he trusts me to do that. So they said, let's not identify the items. And Graves said, I'm going to identify the rod, which was perfect because it was a rod of the Pact Keeper, which Phil doesn't even know what it is because he's never played a warlock before. And I explained it's a plus two rod. It gives you plus two to hit if you're using any uh, spells that require an attack roll. And it gives you plus two to your save DC for all your spells. So it feels pretty happy. He's like, oh, this is super useful. Yes, it is. Having now armored themselves up, they cast invisibility. They have a plan. And the plan is focus on the hellhounds. There are four bad guy hellhounds and each one of those things can breathe doing 66 damage to several members of the party at once. And it has a recharge of five or six, which means there's a one in three chance he's gonna be able to do it again. So they really can't figure out a way to deal with this without dealing with the hellhounds first. So that's their plan, attack the hellhounds. I say the 10 minutes is up, it's time to roll initiative. They're gonna bust out of the jail and attack. The heroes mostly win initiative, so they're able to get out of the jail cell and engage the enemy. You should be able to see a picture of it over here and the tiles and miniatures I was using. This is stuff that all gets posted on Twitter, by the way. If you find this story at all engaging, then I recommend you follow me on Twitter at Matt Colville because every time we play D&D, I take pictures of the game. Now, I only take pictures of the dramatic moments, so it's not like you're getting a play-by-play. -play, but it is kind of fun to see this stuff happening live and then come back and hear me talk about what happened later. So now it's combat and they're fighting and they discover a couple things. Like for one thing, even though there are 10 orcs and four hellhounds outside the jail cells there, in. Uh, not all those orcs can get into melee. Not all those hellhounds can breathe without hitting other orcs. So several of the orcs are staying back and peppering the heroes with javelins. Some of the hellhounds are on leashes. And basically I'm holding half the hellhounds back for when the first rank all die. So that's another, I don't know, is that a lesson? That's a technique? I don't know. But I had a lot of bad guys and it seemed impossible. But once they started fighting in close quarters in these corridors, it became obvious there was no way for the bad guys to bring all their forces to bear. And that made it seem more realistic that they could take on this much larger force. And in truth, there was probably a way, if my friend Jim Murphy, for instance, was running the game, that dude is legitimately a tactical mastermind. He would have found ways to get all these orcs into combat. Like there was literally a point where in a very Jim Murphy way, I had an orc move, throw a javelin, and then move again so an orc behind him could move and throw a javelin. And that way they were cycling in and out of line of sight. And that put the fear of God into some of the players. But once I had done that once or twice, I lay off that a little bit. 
and the players kind of forgot about it. It's a complex battle. You don't always have to press every advantage, right? The players will notice if the bad guys start doing stupid things, but the players won't really notice if most of the bad guys are doing the right thing and a couple of them are behaving suboptimally because the players are really going to be focused on guys like Bonebreaker Doricor. Which, since we brought him up, let's talk about what happened. The first thing that happens is EJ charges into battle with Bonebreaker Doricor. So now we have the half-orc fighter and the actual orc chieftain. And the thing about being a half-orc in my setting is nobody likes you. The orcs call you half-breed and the humans call you half-breed. Which sucks. I don't think that's fun for EJ, but at the same time, I can't let up, right? Because he is a half-orc. I want him to feel like this is what it's like being a half-orc in this world. I don't belong anywhere. And the payoff there is, in spite of not belonging anywhere, in spite of the humans not trusting him and the orcs not liking him, he is behaving heroically. He is doing all the heroic things. He came down here to save all these people. So he's earning people's trust, like all the NPCs he just saved, and stay tuned for next week because stuff is going on. He, he has a knight that's following him now. So EJ's half-orc Nicodemus the fighter is wielding the shield of Andrum in one hand, which is a ar powerful artifact. It's a plus two shield. He doesn't know what else it does, but it is a symbol of authority. And I don't mean that in a magical sense. I mean that in a traditional sense. It is a historical thing that inspires people when they see it. It inspired the knight to swear fealty to him. In the other hand, he wields the elven artifact blade Arcturus, the sword of stars. Arcturus is one of the seven, seven, D-R-A-G-O-N, six, one of the six teeth of the dragon, these ancient elven weapons forged by a smith a long time ago uh, in an attempt to stop the end of the world. Now these things are scattered throughout the four winds, and for reasons too complex to explain, Nicodemus is wielding one of them. It's a plus two weapon, it also does lots of other cool stuff, but he is never going to find out what those things are. Because he's a half-orc, and there's no way he can ever attune to it, elves hate orcs. In fact, the guy who came up with the Teeth of the Dragon, again, my friend Jim, when I talked to him, he's like, there is no way a half-orc would be able to use that thing at all. But I thought, well, that's not fun. Let's give EJ at least the opportunity to get the plus two bonus out of it. And after he had used it for several levels, it started to kind of resist him. It's shocked him a couple of times and done a D6 damage to him a couple of times when he tried to use it. It's somewhat random when it happens, but it's basically the sword saying, hey, let me go. I don't like you. So here's EJ facing off against the much larger Bonebreaker Doric or Orc Chieftain. He's got the Shield of Adrum, he's got Arcturus, the Sword of Stars. He attacks, he does some damage. Nicodemus, the Half-Orc Fighter, doesn't do a lot of damage, but he is almost impossible to kill. Nicodemus had his shot, now it's Bonebreaker Doricor's turn. He wields Wound, the Black Iron Axe, and he smashes down into Nicodemus with it. I roll in front of the players, and I roll a 19. And as you know, Wound crits on a 19 or 20. This is the first time the players have encountered a weapon that crits on anything but a 20, and they are pretty impressed, and I don't mean that in a good way, right? Impressed like, oh my god, we're all gonna die. And it's a lot of damage, right? It's a great axe, it's a magical great axe, so he's rolling damage twice, and because he critted, he inflicted a wound. So it's a lot of damage, and he's got a wound, but then something interesting happens. Because the way I described Bonebreaker Dorcor's axe critting Nicodemus was that Nicodemus holds up the shield of Andrim, the axe smashes into it, it smashes into him, the axe cuts into his head, but upon impact with the shield of Andrim, something happens. The shield rings like a bell. Everyone in the dungeon can hear it. There's the implication that maybe people outside the dungeon can hear it like it's a supernatural noise. And I tell all of his allies, everybody in the party and all the NPCs, right now if you want to, you can use a reaction to spend a hit die, right? And heal yourself by 1d8 or 1d10 or whatever your hit die is. That's one of the effects of the Shield of Andrum. When you are critted, it grants healing to all your allies. This represents the fact that Nicodemus has unlocked some of the abilities of the Shield of Andrum. There's more to come. But the idea here is that he had been behaving heroically, and he had been doing the right thing, and then when a knight pledged service to him, it activated the shield. Someone else decided the owner of the shield was worthy of service, and now the shield is protecting everyone. Also, Bonebreaker Dorokor, after he rolled a 19, I said he hits an armor class of 29. This caused the party to go completely bananas. I was going to use another word that involves monkeys and poo, but I'm trying to keep this channel PG. Actually, is shit PG? I think it is. They went ape shit. They're like, holy crap, he had an AC of 29, we are all going to die. Then I had to point out, look, that's only plus one more to hit than your elf ranger, so now you know what it's like for me. Right, I've got bad guys with decent armor classes, and the elf ranger is just hitting them like they're marshmallows. So that was fun. The players were grumpy and complaining, but I was like, hey, hang on a minute. This is your turnabout is fair play. And they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. Now, as it turns out, rolling a 19 for Bonebreaker Dorcor's first attack was pretty spectacular because, first of all, it showed what Wound could do. And it also meant that the Shield of Andrum got to do its thing and the players got to find out at the very beginning of the battle. That's really cool. They didn't have to wait to find out because it was possible, of course, that Bonebreaker Dorcor might never roll a critical hit. But at the same time, because it happened so early in the battle, nobody except Nicodemus was wounded. 
I mean, Iagushka had taken damage from the Glyph of Warding, but I had given the players Hax, the infidel, the dwarven priest, and I gave him Hax, who is a like cleric of life, like he is a legit healing cleric, because I wanted to free up Keck, the war priest, to be more of a war priest as opposed to a war priest. I think that was one of the problems TJ was having with his character. He wanted to be a battle priest, but he was having to keep the party alive all the time. Now the presence of this dwarven priest means that there's someone in the party, an NPC, who can focus on healing, and Keck can focus on fighting. That made a huge difference because now they really had two healers, three if you count Iagushka, and even though a lot of orcs are attacking and hellhounds are breathing and the bad guy priest is casting spells, the players were able to keep each other alive. A whole bunch of crazy stuff happened. I'm not going to give you the blow by blow, largely because I didn't write it all down. I don't remember it. There was a point when Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, pointed at Nicodemus and cast a spell, and Nicodemus had to make a saving throw. Right, like a wisdom saving throw, and he doesn't have a great wisdom. I think actually has a penalty to wisdom. I'm not sure. But he rolled well, and he made it, and I said, okay, you are not banished to another plane. And the player's are like, what? He can do what? He can banish us to another plane? That's insane! I love that spell. I use it against the players all the time, and each time I do it, well, the first time I do it, I have the players make a religion check to tell what spell is being cast, and then I describe the spell to them. It's banishment, and if it's successful, it will it will send you to another plane. Right, I think literally what I said is, okay, good job, Nicodemus, you are not banished to the plane of fire. Now, it wouldn't have been the plane of fire because the spell says it's like a neutral plane, and you wouldn't have been banished forever, but it was dramatic, and it made the players go, holy moly, which was the effect I was looking for. But if he had failed to save, he would have been banished somewhere. I've done that before. It just means that character is removed from the combat for the rest of the encounter, which sounds like a big deal. And I think probably it would have been devastating to the party, but not fatal. We would have seen, well, it would have been fatal for somebody probably. Nobody died in this entire battle on the hero's side. And I think that was a combination, obviously, of the magic items they had found and the NPCs they had found and the fact they were fighting in close quarters and the fact that they were outnumbered, the bad guys couldn't all get into combat with them. But if they had lost Nicodemus to the banishment, then I think things would have been very different. As it turned out, it was a very dramatic battle. At the end of the night, everyone was stoked. They were full of energy. They felt like they had had pulled off something incredible. I definitely got a sense that they felt like they had accomplished something, not that I had handed them something. But had Nicodemus been banished, it would have been very different. The heroes go, the orcs go, the hellhounds breathe, Iagushka is reduced to one hit point, the dwarf heals him. Their strategy to focus on the hellhounds works for a little while until Bonebreaker Dorakar starts attacking other people, and they realize we have got to kill this guy. He could probably single-handedly take on the entire party. His armor class isn't that great, but he's got crazy hit points and he just does so much damage, and he never misses. This creates a critical decision moment for the ranger, Psy, because Psy has the white arrow. He has no idea what it does, but he knows it's magical. On the first round of combat, people were saying, use the arrow on one of the orcs, or use the arrow on a hellhound. And indeed, there was a regular orc and a hellhound right in front of them, and both of those were good targets. And he was thinking, do I use it on the hellhound? Do I use it on the orc? And I was like, which are you gonna, are you gonna use it on the hellhound? Are you gonna use it, uh, maybe you should use it on the orc. And I would literally say stuff like, those are both good targets, you never know what it might do. Might make a big difference in the battle. Now, this evening, we were joined by our friend Anna, who is a member of the Tuesday night group, but she's there at work. We're all playing at work. And so she just asked if she could hang out with us and watch. And then after a while, I said, hey, do you want to run one of these NPCs? And she said, sure. So she joined the group as another player running the NPC hacks. And as I was kind of trying to seduce the Elven Rangers player, Matt Alpert, into using the white arrow in a non-optimal way, which he could not have known. He doesn't know what the optimal way is. Anna detects this. Her ears prick up and she's like, wait, 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 don't listen to him. Because she's heard this kind of stuff from you before and she knows what kind of DM I am, she recognizes Matt is trying to trick you into using that thing in a suboptimal way, which I was. That's just something I do for fun. I do it completely sincerely as I'm doing it. I'm, I want to make it seem like I am legitimately trying to help that player out, right? But I do it in a theatrical and dramatic manner that is not entirely appropriate for that moment. And that's the hint. That's the clue. And some players fall for it and some players don't. But Anna had played with me a lot before and so she recognized it and she told Matt Albert, don't listen to him. Do not listen when the GM suggests stuff. I will often have NPC players join the party because, you know, the heroes need a cleric or whatever. And I'll have these NPCs like, hack the Dwarven Cleric, who would suggest insane things. Because I don't want the players to think, oh, if the suggestion is coming from the DM, we should listen to it. Like, the DM put this character in the party, we should listen to him. That's probably why Matt put this guy in the party with us, so Matt would have a voice. I don't want them to think that way, I don't want them to rely on me, so I often have the NPC suggest ridiculous things to do, and even when there's no NPC around, I will goad the players and try to get them to, you know, beat on the drum and light the candle and ring the bell just to see what might happen. Matt Alpert wisely resisted my foul blandishments and thought about it for a second and said, I'm going to shoot the white arrow at Bonebreaker Doracor. He's operating purely on instinct. There was a literally nothing he had encountered that gave him any indication this was a good idea. On the other hand, he had no reason to think it was a bad idea. And certainly Bonebreaker Doracor was the nastiest thing in this group. He hit, 
The White Arrow, upon hitting Bronebreaker Dorocore, instead of doing a D8 as a normal arrow does, plus a D6 for size Hunter Mark, does this. Because the White Arrow is an arrow of orc slaying. I describe the arrow as sinking into Bonebreaker Dorocore and literally dissolving, disappearing. Bonebreaker Dorocore goes ash white and falls to one knee. He has to lean on wound to stop himself from falling over. I mean, this arrow did about 50 or 60 points of damage to Bonebreaker Dorocore. It didn't kill him, but it brought him within range of being able to be killed. Why did I think I could get away with giving the players an arrow of orc slaying without it feeling like it was a gimme, like it was something I was giving them explicitly to kill Bonebreaker Dorocore? I'll tell you, because I knew they could identify only one thing. And that was the gamble. I don't think they ever felt like I gave them this explicitly to kill this orc chieftain because they understood there was no reason for them to be able to figure out what it was. If they had used identified on the white arrow, they still would have felt like they had earned something because they guessed what the right item was to identify. They would have known, holy moly, we're incredibly lucky we picked this. And they would be wondering, what do these other things do? Which is what I want them to wonder. I don't want them to feel like the answers are easy and obvious. I want them to feel earned. Having not cast Identify on the White Arrow, having used it by instinct and picked the biggest, baddest guy in the party, even though it was an arrow of orc slaying and they were fighting orcs, they felt like this was awesome. They felt like this was earned. Furthermore, they realized this was something that the human priest had. This was his backup in case Bonebreaker Dorcor turned on him. Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, could use the White Arrow on Bonebreaker Dorcor. And that made it seem even more plausible and realistic because the two evil characters, the evil human and the evil orc, don't trust each other. And one of them is hoarding all of these magic items for the day when he has to fight Bonebreaker Dorcor. Now, the fact that he didn't die was even sort of more impressive to the players. He had just suffered 50 or 60 damage, certainly enough damage to outright kill any party member. But Bonebreaker Dorcor was still alive, and now he was angry. He gets up, and he commands his orcs with his war chieftain ability, and now they all have advantage on their next attacks. And the players think, even though the White Arrow just almost killed this guy, they think, we're doomed which is kind of what I want. I want it to regularly feel like a pulp adventure movie, like the players are constantly going from the frying pan into the fire, that every triumph is followed by some kind of problem that arises. Graves mentions offhandedly that the scroll he found was useless because contact of the plane isn't going to help them. And I'm like, what do you mean it's useless? It's got all these awesome spells on it. And he's like, what awesome spells? And I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell you what else was on there. There's the hunger of Hadar and Gash's form. Gash's form is on there just in case somebody needs to get away. I thought that would be an interesting decision-making process. If things went catastrophically bad, Graves would have to make the decision, cast Gash's form and get away so we could fight another day or go down swinging. Now, nobody in the group knows what the hunger of Hadar is, so Phil has to look it up, and then Phil starts chuckling. And on Graves' turn, he says, I cast the hunger of Hadar on Bonebreaker Dorocor. Hunger of Hadar is a powerful high-level warlock spell, and it may seem like I was giving the players a get-out-of-jail-free card, but I'm pretty sure the players didn't perceive it that way because they still had to earn it. Because since it is a fourth-level spell and Graves can't cast fourth-level spells, he had to make a spellcraft check to see if he could get it off. And because of the way that works, he had basically a 50% chance of succeeding, and that's what made it feel like it was still something they had to earn. There was a chance of failure. There was a chance that Phil would roll badly. And in truth, Hunger of Hadar could change the tide of battle. If Graves had failed, it would have been like a Nicodemus being banished. If I had given them something of comparable power, but there was no chance of failure, there was no, you know, glyph of warding on the secret door, then it wouldn't have felt earned, it would have felt like a gimme. So I don't mind giving the players power beyond their normal ability if it requires some kind of price. It has to be paid for in some way, either there was a trap that they had to bypass or there was a spell roll they had to make. And it's always nice when, as in this case, Phil is about to make a roll and everyone knows this is a critical roll. <laughs> critical roll. Everyone knows this is a critical roll and they're all watching. Including me, I was on the edge of my seat along with all the other players. Of course, Phil rolled great. He rolled like a 15. He succeeded easily. One entire half of the dungeon is consumed by this starry void that comes out of nowhere, in which the players can see constellations and galaxies and swirling tentacles and it's freezing cold. They hear the orcs screaming. The players have never seen anything like this and they're like, oh, holy moly. That's not literally what they said. You could use your imagination. You'd probably be right. But this is definitely a turning of the tide moment. The hunger of Hadar begins to consume the orcs. It does several things, some good, some bad. The orcs who are within it cannot see the heroes and therefore have disadvantage. On the other hand, the heroes that are outside it cannot see into it and therefore also have disadvantage. They know where Bonebreaker Dorcor is standing. He's standing at the edge of the uh, field of the hunger of Adar, but they can't see him. So they have penalties targeting him. Bonebreaker Dorcor, even though he's taking a D6 or something, he's taking damage every round he stays in this thing, he does not yield his ground. He continues to fight. 
Old Breaker Dorakor is going to go down swinging, and there is a good chance he's going to kill someone in the process. But Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, runs. So now I have a recurring bad guy. They're going to fight that dude later, although it's going to be a little while, we'll see. He takes many of the orcs with him, and they retreat to the upper level. While the hunger of Adar is chewing on the orcs, something else happened that the players hadn't anticipated. They knew that down here somewhere, based on their reconnoitering, was a halfling thief. Specifically, a character named Patty Shrillwhistle who was a member of Graves' original party who had been captured by these guys. That's the reason Graves came here in the first place. Horak the dwarf saw Patty escape, he thinks. When Iagushka the druid reported back to the party that he saw a halfling working with Bonebreaker Dorkor, Phil concluded, that is the halfling from my party, she must be mind-controlled. And indeed, the way these bad guys end up getting these powerful wizards and bringing them below, kidnapping them, is by slipping these powerful potions of domination into their food. These potions of domination are not normal potions of domination. They are incredibly powerful and a major plot point in this adventure. So Phil thinks that's what's going on. They entertain the notion that maybe Patty is working for the bad guys just until there's an opportunity for her to escape. But they know she's out there somewhere, and all during the battle they're wondering, where's that halfling thief? We know she's supposed to be around here. Well, she had drunk a potion of invisibility. And so once the hunger of Hadar went off, suddenly Patty appeared next to Graves. And she had a crazy look on her face. It wasn't the same look people with the potion of domination had. It was more like she was hungry. She wanted to destroy Graves. And of course, she's going after Graves because he cast the hunger of Hadar, but she's also going after him because he is her old party member. So there's a little drama here. She stabs Graves. She does a bunch of damage. The heroes gang up on her. They finish off Bonebreaker Dorkor. Finally, there's a lot of cheering. They're killing orcs. They're killing hellhounds. Orcs are retreating. And they finally are able to kill Patty Shrillwhistle. But Graves says, wait, wait, don't kill her. We use uh, subdual damage, so we just want to knock her out. But that doesn't work, I ruled, because she, upon being knocked out, hits her head against the flagstones, and her head literally splits open. And this crawls out of her head. I show the players a picture, and they're like, oh my god, what is that? And now they have an intellect devourer to fight. This is another sign, along with the potions of domination, along with the discussions of people being taken below, that the Underdark is active in this. The Underdark bad guys have given Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, an ally in this intellect devourer. And the intellect devourer starts attacking people. Sai attacks the intellect devourer, does a lot of damage to it, so of course it turns around and attacks him. And it's a mental attack, so of course I use the universal symbol for you are being attacked mind to mind. ba na 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 I have Psy make a saving throw against the Intellect of Hour's ability, and he succeeds, and I said, good, because if he had failed his save, not only would he have taken damage, I would have also gotten to roll 3d6. If I roll higher than Psy's intellect, Psy's intellect goes to zero, right? He basically becomes a drooling, gibbering idiot, and there wouldn't be anything he can do about it until I think he goes and finds somebody to cast Restoration on him. It's crazy which is to say it's super cool. So it may seem anticlimactic, but that was basically the battle. The hunger of Hadar started to wipe out the rest of the orcs. The heroes were able to concentrate on the other orcs in the other wing, many of whom hadn't attacked yet. They were able to start taking out the hellhounds. The hellhounds were breathing, but the hellhounds were never able to angle their breath in such a way to get more than one or two heroes at a time. The heroes were really good about positioning. There was one last cool thing that happened when the players thought they had killed Bonebreaker Dorkor. He only went to one hit point because earlier in the battle at the beginning, before the heroes busted out of the jail, Rosad had cast Death Ward on him. So even though they knew he only had a few hit points left and they critted him or did some ridiculous amount of damage, it didn't kill them and they could sense that there was something protecting him. So he lived to fight one more round and then he died and it was epic and the heroes were like, that was amazing. And now it was like one o'clock in the morning and they were ready to stop. They mopped up the orcs, they mopped up the hellhounds, several of the orcs, none of the hellhounds, but Rosad, the priest of St. Ajax, are now in the upper level waiting. And somewhere up there is an ogre and maybe a couple more orcs, who knows? So the heroes are still down in the dungeon, that's where we left things. They know there are some bad guys upstairs, but it can't be as bad as the situation down here. They got a bunch of treasure, they're going to get a bunch of XP, they're probably going to level up once they have a chance to actually rest. I don't allow players to level up in the middle of the dungeon, they have to basically be able to get back to town. Whatever town means, they're a safe place. So the party have defeated Bonebreaker Dorocor, they've chased off Rosad, they fought a bunch of orcs, they killed all the hellhounds, and they defeated Patty Shrillwhistle, the halfling thief being controlled by the intellect devourer, who then emerged from her skull like Athena rising from the head of Zeus, and then they killed the intellect devourer. And that's where we left things. The players are down in the second level of the dungeon. They have some more items to identify. They have some treasure. Next week is probably going to be the first good stopping point for this campaign. They're going to clear out the upper level. I don't think there's that many bad guys left up there. There is the ogre. They're going to find out some dramatic stuff that I think is going to be super cool. And then I think we're going to take a little break. I have another group of people at TSR, my Tuesday night game, who are kind of waiting to find out what happens next in their game. They finished their book one and they're ready for book two. And the Tuesday night group, if I start running for them, something I would like to do is I would like to show you exactly how I prep an adventure. Like literally walk you through my process of reading the adventure, finding out who the bad guys are, and taking notes and writing down what I expect to happen. 
I think that would be super useful. It would be a great way to demystify the process and show you how I take an adventure and turn it into something I'm ready to run. I'm not going to tell you which adventure I'm going to use as an example yet because I don't want to spoil it for the Tuesday night group, but it's one of the most popular adventure from the third edition of the game. I thought about prepping the adventure in the D&D starter set Lost Mine of Flamflim, Flam Flam Floop, Floopin Snurt, Snit. Fandelver. God, what a terrible name. Lost Mine of Fandelver, but I don't have a first level group standing by, and I'm really not, I mean, I don't have the opportunity. I can't run three games. That's crazy. I mean, there may be some distant future video where I do have a first level group ready, and I'll prep Lost Mine of Flangelflugroom. Because in spite of how ridiculous I think the name is, I do think it's a good adventure. Fandelver, come on, what kind of name is that? I want a really cool name like the Lost Caverns of Sojkanth. And in case you're wondering, that is a joke. If I were doing this video series in the 1970s, I would totally be making fun of how ridiculous a name Sojkanth is. So that's the latest campaign diary. Stay tuned. We'll see what happens next week when the players finish clearing out Broken Spire Keep and get their ultimate reward. Next episode, we talk about a tool that I would like to create for DMs to make all of our jobs easier. I actually don't have the skill necessary to make this tool, but I can host it. And hopefully through crowdsourcing, we can figure out a solution together. I've enlisted the aid of a very skilled and intelligent enterprise level IT guy to help us out. I don't want to give too much away just because I want to save it for the actual video, but wouldn't it be nice if you could find an adventure that was perfectly suited to whatever your need was as a DM? Because it's my conviction that whatever you need, there must be an adventure out there that already does it, considering how long the game has been out and how many official adventures there have been. So that's what's on tap for next week. As always, there are no ads. I have no Patreon. If you want to help support the channel, I encourage you to come by my Amazon page. You'll find a link to the doobly-doo. I am an independent fantasy author. I write fantasy novels. I have two of them out. I'm working on the third one. Lots of people have bought them. Many people have liked them. Uh, read the reviews. I mean, think of it as you're basically like pledging to a Patreon, except in addition to helping support the channel, you get a book. I encourage you to buy the Kindle version. It's four bucks, of which I see three bucks, as opposed to the print version, which is like $15, of which I only see $1. But whatever, some people like having things in print. Next week, we're going to find the adventure you're looking for. Until then, peace out.